Although the term small arms ammunition normally includes calibers below 60 or 6 tenths of an inch, ammunition for the 20 millimeter and 37 millimeter aircraft cannon is included in this subject for convenience. Each ammunition box arrives from the manufacturer with both written and color identification on the front and back. The 50 caliber tracer is designated by a yellow and green diagonal stripe. The 50 caliber ball cartridge with a solid red stripe. The 50 caliber armor piercing with a yellow and blue stripe. This color identification system is also true of the 30 caliber cartridge, except that the stripe is vertical instead of diagonal. Also, all ammunition boxes are marked with the number of cartridges contained, the arsenal from which they came, and the lot number. When the ammunition supply is received at the storage depot, it should be immediately sorted according to caliber and lot number, and stored in a dry place. To keep ammunition boxes and their contents dry, they should be kept from coming in contact with the floor or ground, by the use of dunnage. This provides an airspace beneath the boxes, which should also be provided between each tier. Canvas covering, if available, should be used even indoors to protect against possible roof leaks. For outside storage at an ammunition dump, it is very important to see that the dunnage is sufficient to keep water from reaching the boxes. Secondly, an airspace should be provided between each box to allow free circulation on all four sides. Airspace is also provided between successive tiers by placing additional planks on top of the lower boxes before the next layer is stacked. For protection from weather, canvas cover should be placed over the stack of ammunition boxes and tied down securely. These covers will act as protection against the direct rays of the sun and from the rain and snow. The covers for the 50, 30 and 45 caliber packing boxes are fastened with wing nuts. A seal placed on the box by the arsenal must be broken before the lid is removed. The hermetically sealed inner liner or ammunition container found inside the box may be opened by grasping the handle provided and exerting a strong pull, tearing back the metal. If the container has been sealed exceptionally well and will not respond to a hand tug, a board inserted through the handle should be used as a pry. To open the 37 millimeter packing boxes, the seal on the hinged hasp must be removed first. Packers certificates and the loader's designation will be found in each ammunition packing box. The metal inner liner is opened in the same manner as shown in previously opened boxes. Twenty 37 millimeter shells are packed in each box and are separated from each other by individual wooden partitions. The box containing 50 caliber ammunition holds 300 cartridges packed in 30 cartons of 10 rounds each. Unused cartridges of a certain lot number should be returned to the boxes of the corresponding number. The box containing 30 caliber ammunition holds 1,500 cartridges packed in 75 cartons of 20 rounds each. The box containing 45 caliber ammunition holds 2,000 cartridges packed in 100 cartons of 20 rounds each.
12 gauge shotgun shells are packed in an ordinary wooden box without the inner liner. A box holds 500 shells packed in 20 paper cartons. All these ammunition cartons are lightly constructed and are very susceptible to moisture. Although ammunition packing boxes are ruggedly constructed to carry the heavy weight they contain, they should never be dropped, but should be set down easily and evenly. By dropping this packing box on its corner, the damage that a very slight fall can do to a wooden box is clearly demonstrated. The weight of the contents makes even these rugged boxes easily broken. Care must also be observed in stacking the packing boxes. Rough handling like this may easily open the seams of the metal inner liner and admit moisture into the box. If the box is left in the rain or under a leaky roof for any length of time, water may accumulate on top of the inner liner and eventually find its way through the breaks in the inner liner seal caused by rough handling. Condensation which accumulates on the liner as a result of temperature changes may also find its way inside the liner if the box has been roughly handled. Any moisture which enters the inner liner will be absorbed by the cardboard ammunition cartons. Eventually this dampness will corrode the brass cartridges to such an extent that they will be worthless. The functional effects of moisture in powder may be readily demonstrated by placing dry and damp powder side by side and igniting them with an electric current which heats both simultaneously. The ignition delay produced by the moisture is at once apparent. Moisture which has collected on the cartridges may gain entry to the powder through damage to the crimping, which holds the projectile in the case. Also, rough handling may loosen the primer to such an extent that moisture can gain entrance between the primer and the cartridge case. These corroded cartridges are a very good example of the extended action of water or dampness on brass. Obviously, the hard corrosive crust on the cartridges renders them useless as ammunition. Cleaning the cartridge adequately cannot be done because the corrosion has eaten into the case, pocking the metal. This renders the cartridge unserviceable for use because it will not fit properly in the weapon's firing chamber. If this corrosive action is allowed to continue long enough, the mouth of the case will split down into the neck and shoulder of the cartridge. Obviously, such ammunition is worthless. Partially used boxes of ammunition, which are to be replaced in storage, should be sealed with friction tape along the broken edge of the inner liner. This is an effective temporary seal for the ammunition's protection. An identification tag should be fastened to all broken lot ammunition before it is returned to the box. This tag should bear the lot number. Further, the number of cartridges written on the card found in all ammunition boxes should be corrected to read the exact number left in the inner liner and the box. Cartridges should at all times be protected from dirt and foreign substances as dirt and gritty deposits may cause the gun to misfire or jam, perhaps with disastrous results. Any dirty ammunition held in links or belts or clips should be removed to be cleaned. In no instance should cartridges be polished or oiled, as this may also cause the gun to jam. When possible, empty cartridge cases are salvaged and returned to the manufacturer for resizing and reloading.
small arms ammunition group is limited to a maximum projectile diameter of six tenths of an inch. The 50, 30, and 45 caliber cartridges are the most commonly used of that group by most ground and air forces. The 50 caliber cartridge is adopted as the modern standard for heavy machine gun fire and is the most effective of all small arms ammunition when employed against opposing aircraft, bomber, pursuit, or interceptor. The 30 caliber cartridge, although practically obsolete for aerial use, is still the standard for ground forces and is also effectively used by aircraft for ground strafing. The 45 caliber cartridge has a very effective striking power at close range and is therefore used for close-in defense and attack. The 50 caliber ball cartridge has a plain unpainted projectile tip. In peacetime, 50 caliber ammunition is packed in cartons, 10 rounds to the carton. During wartime, they are issued in belt links. Different cartridges are filled with different cores. 50 caliber ball bullets contain a soft steel core. The 30 as well as the 45 caliber is filled with antimonial lead. The armor-piercing cartridge has a black projectile tip, which classifies it immediately as armor-piercing, even when separated from its container. The core of the armor-piercing projectile leaves the jacket when striking armor plate. The core of most armor-piercing projectiles is made of manganese molybdenum steel. It has a lead slug in the tip, which, with the nose of the jacket, acts as a starter for the armor-piercing core when striking armor plate. As it hits, the jacket with the leading lead slug crumples and folds back, partially melting with a rapid fusing action after making contact, the armor-piercing core continuing through the armor. During peacetime, tracer ammunition also comes in cartons. The standard wartime packing is in metallic belt links or fabric machine gun belts. The tips of tracer projectiles are painted red. Here, the tracer composition has been removed from the jacket, but clearly it would fill half of the projectile. The tracer is preceded by a solid lead ball, which fills the nose of the copper jacket. The 50 caliber tracer will burn for approximately eight seconds. In actual firing, the tracer composition is ignited by the flame of the propellant powder. The purpose of these tracer projectiles is to enable the gunner to direct the spray of bullets upon the target. This action is particularly valuable to aircraft gunnery, where fighting is done at high speeds. The 30 caliber cartridge, except for size, is essentially identical with 50 caliber ammunition. This is true of all types. The 45 caliber ball and the 45 caliber tracer have the same general construction as the 30 caliber ammunition. The ball carrying a solid lead slug in the jacket and the tracer having a lead slug preceding the tracer composition. The 45 caliber tracer is distinguished by a red tip. The tracer burns for a comparatively short time. The cases of the 50 and the 30 caliber cartridges are more narrow at the mouth than at the head. That is, they have a neck and shoulder. The neck is thinner than the rest of the case and is of springy brass which allows it to expand during firing and to contract after the expulsion of all propellant gases. During manufacture, the cartridge is waterproofed with an application of varnish.
Then, when the projectile is inserted, this varnish plus the crimp of the mouth fitting into the cannelure or groove of the projectile prevents the projectile from coming loose during handling. In rifles or machine guns, the igniting of the propellant is accomplished in this manner. The primer is fired when struck by the firing pin, which pinches the igniting mixture between the brass cup and the anvil. A flame is thus produced, which passes through a vent hole in the body of the case. This flame, in turn, ignites the propellant. The copper alloy jacket of the projectile is soft enough to allow the rifling of the weapon's barrel to cut grooves into the jacket, rotating the projectile and creating a centrifugal force in flight that prevents wobbling or tumbling. The softness of the jacket also allows the metal to fit tightly enough against the walls of the barrel to prevent the propellant gases from escaping ahead of the projectile. The rifling cuts are deep and definite, demonstrating how tightly the jacket fits into the barrel. In the use of all small arms ammunition, three very definite factors should be considered. Cartridges should never be oiled. From a mistake such as this, high pressures or desensitizing of the primer may result. Secondly, if cartridges in links or clips should become dirty, they should be removed from the links or clips for cleaning. Thirdly, during combat or range firing, there is great danger of rebound or ricochet. This is true of all types of ammunition, though especially of armor piercing, when complete penetration is not accomplished. The danger area may be assumed, depending upon varying conditions, as a 200-yard radius from the object. Naturally, no fast rule for rebound or ricochet can be arrived at, as there are too many erratic factors. However, this danger should be seriously considered when the gun crew or other friendly troops are within this area. On land or in the air, your security depends on your ammunition. Use it properly and it will serve you well. Small arms includes a variety of weapons from the 22 caliber pistol to the 50 caliber machine gun. Most used of these weapons is the caliber 45 automatic pistol, for it is the only weapon common to all branches of the military service. The clip for the 45 automatic pistol is released from the grip by pressing the magazine catch. Seven 45 caliber cartridges are the pistol's complement. The thumb is used to force the cartridges into the clip nose forward. This thumb action also holds true for the unloading procedure.
The United States rifle, caliber 30, M1903, sometimes known as the Springfield, has been the most commonly used in the service. It employs a light five-round clip with a spring center. This clip is loaded when it arrives from the manufacturer, but it may be easily reloaded by hand in the field. To load the clip into the rifle, first throw the cutoff into the up position so that the legend on may be read. Then withdraw the bolt and force the loaded clip into the clip shots with the thumb. The cartridges leave the clip in loading and are left in the magazine in a staggered position. When the bolt is closed, the gun is ready to fire. To set the rifle on safety, the safety lock is moved into a direct vertical position. The rifle cannot be fired with the safety on because the firing pin will not release, although the bolt handle may be worked. The gun is made ready to fire again by reversing the safety to its down or off position. To load the model 1903 rifle for single shot action, the cutoff is pushed down until the legend off may be read. Then the bolt is withdrawn and a single cartridge is inserted into the chamber. When the bolt is returned and locked into position, the gun is ready to fire singly. To unload, the bolt is retracted. This extracts and ejects the cartridge. The M1 rifle, sometimes known as the Garand, is the most modern in the service, having a semi-automatic action. The safety for the M1 rifle is hinged to the trigger guard. An operating rod opens and closes the bolt. The M1 clip is made of light springy metal which holds eight rounds in a staggered position. It may be easily loaded by hand. The method for inserting the loaded clip into the rifle is first set the gun to safe, then pull back the operating rod opening the bolt. The clip is next inserted into the magazine using the thumb to press it firmly downward until it is seated. The rifle will not fire as long as the safety is in the on position. However, when the safety is released, depressing the trigger for each shot will cause the gun to fire semi-automatically until the eight rounds are exhausted. To release the clip, the operating rod is pulled back, opening the bolt, and the clip latch is pushed. This empties the rifle's magazine. In action, after firing the last shot, the clip is automatically ejected. The Browning automatic rifle is capable of intense firepower for short periods. The capacity of the standard magazine for this rifle is 20 cartridges, which are loaded into the magazine from the five round clips by means of the magazine filler. The magazine may also be loaded by hand using unclipped cartridges. Make certain the cartridges are pointing forward. Then, insert the magazine between the sides of the receiver in front of the trigger guard and push it firmly home until it engages in the magazine catch. The change lever controls the rate of fire of the 1918 A2 model, which has a speed regulator. To set the rifle at safe, depress the change lever stop and pull the change lever rearward until it covers the change lever stop. 
This position is marked S. For full automatic fire or continuous fire to the capacity of the magazine, set the change lever in the vertical position against the change lever stop marked A. For semi-automatic fire for the 1918 model, push the change lever to the forward position marked F. In this position, the 1918 A2 model produces a reduced rate of fire instead of the semi-automatic. The magazine may be easily removed by simply pressing the magazine release. With the Thompson submachine gun, the bolt is hand operated by the actuator knob. The safety is a small lever on the left side plate. The drum magazine for the Thompson submachine gun holds 50 rounds of 45 caliber ammunition. The drum magazine has a rotor which feeds the cartridges to the weapons. Each division of the rotor is loaded bullet up with five rounds until the end of the spiral track is reached. With the magazine properly and completely loaded, the cover is replaced. The wind key is then attached and the rotor is subsequently wound the number of clicks indicated on the magazine nameplate. To insert the drum magazine into the weapon, the safety should first be set, then checked by depressing the trigger. The drum is then inserted from left to right in the horizontal grooves. The magazine should always hold securely. In order to fire, the safety is released. Then when the trigger is pulled, the forward movement of the bolt feeds a round of ammunition into the chamber firing the gun. This submachine gun also employs a box magazine, which holds 20 rounds of 45 caliber ammunition. The cartridges are loaded easily into the box magazine, forcing down the spring, which actuates the feeding. To insert the loaded magazine into the weapon, Grooves on the box and on the gun are engaged. And the magazine is pushed upward until it clicks into place. Fifty caliber ammunition is often loaded into belts for firing from machine guns. Fabric belts are used for the caliber 50 gun for experimental work only. To load the belt, it is first placed in the belt loading machine and the first cartridge is inserted into it by hand. The second cartridge in the machine is also helped into the belt. Then the loading machine is ready to be closed and locked down for final operation. If care is taken in starting the first two cartridges, the machine will feed into the belt simply and evenly when the handle is turned without jamming. cartridges will lie in perfect alignment.
More frequently today, however, ammunition is fed to machine guns in metal links, which are used for all standard caliber 50 belt loading and all aircraft caliber 30 belt loading. Cartridges are loaded into links by the use of the link loader, which is simple to operate. After the links and the cartridges are in place, the handle is pushed forward until the cartridges are fully home and in alignment. Care should always be exercised in attaining perfect alignment, as imperfect alignment will produce what is known as short rounds, which will not function in the weapon. These are examples of short rounds. The 50 caliber machine gun, which is the heaviest of all small arms, is used both by ground forces and aircraft. This is true of either the fixed or the flexible types of aircraft guns. Before loading the machine gun, it is advisable to set the weapon to safety. This will prevent loading accidents. To do this, the safety bar is pushed over until the letter S is visible. Next, the cover is raised and the first cartridge in the links is placed beyond and engaged by the belt holding paw. After this is done, the cover is closed. The retracting slide is pulled to the rear twice to place a cartridge in the firing chamber. To unload the gun, raise the cover and lift the extractor claw. Pull the retracting slide to the rear twice. The cartridge in the chamber will be thrown out through the opening in the bottom of the gun. When the cover is raised, the loaded belt in the feedway will drop out. For the fixed 50 caliber machine guns that fire from pursuit airplanes, a metal magazine carrying 200 rounds is employed. The cartridges in links are snaked into the magazine evenly and carefully so that jams will not occur during combat. The end cartridges are fed over the built-in counter of the magazine. The counter registers the number of rounds fired, informing the pilot fighter constantly of his remaining supply. After closing the magazine, it is ready to be attached to the fixed 50 caliber machine gun for aircraft. For flexible aircraft guns, another type of machine gun magazine is employed. Guns installed in the wings of airplanes have magazine trays or racks which hold several hundred rounds of ammunition. Power feeds are used on many of the new installations. This magazine is smaller than the fixed type, holding only 50 rounds. To load the flexible magazine, the cartridges are snaked in carefully. The 30 caliber machine gun is essentially the same weapon as the 50 caliber gun except for size. However, the 30 caliber gun will fire more rapidly. The 30 caliber cartridges are loaded into links in the same manner as the 50 caliber, except that the loader will hold 20 links instead of 10 and 20 cartridges. The loading operation is the same also, taking care that short rounds are avoided. Always be careful of the alignment of cartridges in links for machine gun use. Before loading the machine gun, the safety bar should be pushed into the safe position. This will prevent loading accidents. To load the gun, First, lift the cover. 
This is easily done by turning the latch found on the right side of the 30 caliber machine gun. With the cover up, the ammunition is fed into the mechanism just so far as the first cartridge will be held by the belt holding paw. When the cartridges are in position, the cover is closed. The gun is made ready to fire by pulling the retracting slide twice. Although 30 caliber ammunition is being replaced by the caliber 50 for aerial use in modern fighting, it is still used aboard many modern airplanes for ground strafing. The aircraft ammunition magazine for the 30 caliber fixed gun will hold 500 rounds. These cartridges are evenly and carefully snaked into position to prevent jamming. And they are fed down through the end opening over the revolving ammunition counter. The flexible 30 caliber aircraft gun also employs a light metal magazine. This small magazine carries 100 rounds and is fastened to the machine gun as is the flexible magazine for the 50 caliber gun. It is loaded in the same manner as the larger 30 caliber fixed magazine. All small arms are precision made instruments made to function efficiently as such and are therefore meant to be handled carefully and with thorough knowledge.